All right, so we're going to begin with two important lessons. The first comes from the greatest classic Christmas, Christmas movie. You all know the one I'm talking about. You might say it with me. Die Hard. <laughs> of course. Now, this movie is not only heartwarming, uh, but also instructive, offering several life lessons. I'm just going to focus on one. Um, the antagonists in the movie, the thieves, they have a plan. That were it not for the plucky New York City cop, John McClane, would have gone off brilliantly. Right? The plan relies on a basic assumption about the way people operate. You can't find what you're not looking for. Their plan is to take all the money from this, this one company uh, and then give everyone the impression that they have perished in an explosion and then slip away. This way, no one will find them because no one will be looking for them. And you can't find what you're not looking for. Right? Now, the second lesson. This one is parallel to the first, has nothing to do with Die Hard. Um, but the second lesson is, if you don't know what you're waiting for, it's likely that you're not going to know it when you see it. This lesson was learned the hard way by uh, BBC, by the BBC News team about 10 years ago, when they invited a man named Guy Cuny, a British technology expert, onto their show to talk about a legal dispute relating to Apple. Meanwhile, a computer technician named Guy Goma showed up for a job interview for a computer-related position. You might see where this is going. Guy Goma, a blue-collar technician is rushed into makeup and then planted in a chair on live TV. <laughs> and before anyone realizes that they've got the wrong guy in the chair for the interview, the commercial break is over and they've started the interview. <laughs> and you can see by the horrified look on Guy Goma's face that he is the first one to realize what's happening. This moment happens when they introduce him to the cameras as Guy Cuny. And in that split second, you can see it dawning on his face. Everything that has led up to this moment, the rushing, the makeup, right, the, the cameras, all of it is now clear, but only to him. And at this point, it's too late. He's on international live television being viewed by millions of people. And that look of terror on his face is exactly the, the look that I would have had in his place. The most shocking part of the interview is actually that he goes on to, to provide some pretty accurate insight about the future of, of music online. Unfortunately, he didn't actually get the job that he was there to apply for. <laughs> now, the point is, the reason why I tell this story is, like I said, if you don't know what you're waiting for, what you're expecting, it's likely that you're not going to know it when you see it. Both of these points have to do with the way that we locate things, identify things, recognize things. And the same sort of thing is happening in first century Judea. Their question was about recognizing the Messiah. And what we see in the Gospels is that there are a lot of people, including the disciples themselves most of the time, who can't find what they should be looking for because they are either not looking for it or they're looking for something else entirely. You've got the Sadducees who are looking for power or their own brand of wisdom. You've got the Pharisees who are looking for their own brand of purity and status. You've got the Romans who are worshiping power. And you've got the general run-of-the-mill 
Jewish population, desperate, beaten down, shell-shocked from the previous eight centuries of hardship. And they're looking only for some sort of overturning of the political order around them. But not everyone is blind to what Jesus is doing. John the Baptist, sitting in a prison cell facing his death, hears that Jesus has been at work. And so he sends a message. And what's clear from John's inquiry and from Jesus' reply is just the sort of thing we should be looking for, just the kinds of activities and concerns that we should expect when God is with us, when God is at work among us, when we encounter the Messiah. So let's read from Matthew chapter 11. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it was written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. This is an odd passage. John is in prison. He's facing his death. But he seems concerned only with the answer to this question. Is Jesus the one they've been waiting for? The one they've been looking for? Or should they keep on waiting? Jesus, in reply, doesn't really answer the question directly. This is a yes or no question. right? Jesus doesn't say yes or no. He says, look at what I've been up to. This is important. But to make sense of what he says, we need to step back a bit. At the start of the Gospels, we are in a setting where many are suffering. Poverty and violence and loss are a pretty common part of people's lives. Here we find a people that has been shut out of the halls and seats of power. These are people that huddle around stories from the past in the way that others huddle around fires. People that rely on those stories and on a desperate hope for the future for any semblance of peace in the present. I think it tells us all that we need to know about their situation, about how tense and fragile their lives must have felt, just from the fact that it was not out of the ordinary in this context to encounter publicly crucified bodies along Roman roads or hung from city walls. The known world for them was ruled by an immense crushing fist. It is merciless. It is indomitable. And so again and again, the Jewish people pass on and relive the stories of the enslavement and the rescue of their ancestors in Egypt. Again and again, they retell the stories of the plagues, the lamb's blood on the doorways, the angel of death, the crossing of the Red Sea, the thunder of Mount Sinai. Again and again, under the looming shadow of the Roman Empire, these people pray and sing the psalms of lament and of hope. Year after year, they return to the prophet's words about one who would come again to provide redemption. And it's in this context that we hear about the approaching birth of a child. We hear Mary singing. 
This is one of the other passages that's in the lectionary for today that's paired with that passage from Matthew 11. It says in Luke chapter 1, verse 46 and following, this is Mary's Magnificat, Mary's song. She says, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations shall call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. According to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Now, Mary, Mary is not meek and mild here. This song is subversive. These are fighting words, right? She opens up the story. She opens up the Gospel of Luke for us, setting the stage for a grand overturning of injustice, a reversal of power structures, dismantling of the pillars that everyone assumes hold up the world. Those living at great heights will be brought low. Those living in abundance and power will be unseated and taken down. And note that she is brazenly, fearlessly proclaiming this message in front of a temple official, right? Her cousin's husband, Zechariah. But what is her message exactly? If we stop reading there, we could write a whole different ending. We might expect a whole different ending. Finally, God will bring a Messiah defined by brute force to topple this unconquerable empire. But we don't stop reading there. What we see in the rest of the story, what we learn from the other passages that we've read today, is that there is a theme, a pattern of God working through those that the world deems small and weak. And this theme is not unique to the Gospels. It's not unique to Mary's song. This is a song that echoes through Scripture. Because this is a message that every generation has needed to hear. In Isaiah, the passage that we read earlier, in the face of the exile of the Jews, we hear about dry, lifeless, unproductive ground where plants will grow and blossom, where water will well up. We hear of a pathway, a walkway, that will be made holy and lead to life, where there will be no ravenous, ravenous beasts, where the ransomed of God will be led back home. And that theme continues in Psalm 146, the other passage that was read earlier. God's power and love and character will be seen most clearly in God's gracious action to save the widow and the orphan, the stranger, the oppressed. And this brings us back to the other passage I'd like to focus on today, the passage I started with from the 11th chapter of Matthew. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. That passage makes sense in light of the others. The story of the Gospels is not really about finding what we want, but about changing what we want. Not wish fulfillment, but
but the transformation of our hearts and wills to love the things that God loves, to do the things that God does. And in this passage, we see that. Jesus' reply to John's question makes it clear that it's not enough to simply seek the location of the things that I desire. Because God's aim in Christ is not first to make sure that we get whatever we hope for and desire. And that's because sometimes we desire, what we desire is not actually what we need. Pretty frequently, my heart is inclined towards the very things that will suck the life out of it. What we often desire is the power to overcome our enemies, fulfill all of our own wishes. And what we are reminded of in this period of waiting each year is that our wishes are not always what they should be. It's not enough to look for the Messiah that I want. I also need God to change my heart so that I don't mistake parched parched land for a wellspring. And here we come back to this theme of reversal. Why do we keep coming back to this theme of reversal? The overturning of the world's notions of power and glory. Why does that theme keep echoing through passage after passage, book after book? It's because each era, each generation is constantly tempted to think that the greatest power is located where there is the greatest destructive force. Force equals power. And what these stories reveal is something radically different. The Messiah, Israel's hope, is identifiable not as an even bigger crushing fist to annihilate the Romans, but rather in weakness, in total self-giving. Those looking for another lion are given a lamb instead. Those who think that death and destructive force always have the final word are given a foot-washing servant who preaches good news to the poor and the lost. And that is where our true hope lies. What Jesus' reply to John tells us is that these are the things we should be looking for. These are the things we should expect. These are the true markers of God's presence and work. But we need to be careful at this point. We are all tempted, myself included, to read these passages, passages like the one from Isaiah about the safe walkway, We're tempted to read these passages only from the perspective of the lamb in need of rescue from the lion. We tend to read these passages from the perspective of those in need, the perspective of the lowly and the humble, those who who will rise up to topple the conquerors. And there is truth to that. These are passages of great hope, of anticipating God's redemptive presence among us. But at the same time, they are also passages of warning. Everyone who reads these passages likes likes to think that they are the ones being promised hope and security from their foes. I am the one who needs a safe road, inaccessible to predators, safe from the wolves. But what we also need to consider from these passages is that we might be the ravenous beasts. We might be the wolves. We might be the ones others need rescue from. What this means is that my redemption will not just be about saving me from others, but saving me from myself, from my own self-centeredness, my own worship of power before love. And so this means that if my first concern is to put Christ back in Christmas, but I am not therefore launched into service in the same ways that Jesus himself said are the primary indicators and signs of his presence and work, then without being aware of it, I might have become one of those ravenous beasts mentioned in these passages. This sort of change in our hearts is not God refusing to fulfill our hopes, 
but teaching us to place our hopes in something other than more parched, dry, lifeless ground. Instead, he offers us a true wellspring of water, where our thirst is quenched, our despair is overcome, precisely by our calling to die into life. I'm going to close with a prayer from uh, Francis of Assisi. It's one of my favorite prayers. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. Amen.